Let's talk about heat and energy. So biological systems have temperature optima because they need to have a certain kinetic energy to put the enzymes in the proper shape for them to do their function to catalyze the reactions. If it's too hot, the enzyme can be denatured. If it's too cold, the conformation closes up and the active sites can't contact where they're supposed to go. So the temperature has to be just right. So here's a place where physics interacts with biology in surface area relations. The bigger the organism, the lower the surface to area ratio. Small organisms have a lot more surface compared to their volume. So if this sphere is an organism, evaporation is heat or moisture leaving the organism. Convection is heat bouncing off and conduction where heat is absorbed and passes through, transferred to another body. So when the sun shines on this sphere or organism, the heat is absorbed and radiated out from the sphere. So the change in the sphere's heat with respect to time is absorbance minus radiance, so the amount of heat that passes through. And the units of energy we use when talking about heat are joules, and one joule is equal to 0.239 calories. And like a sphere, organisms can control energy flux between their insides and outsides by altering their surface area in some way. They can fold, cuddle up, or stretch out. So flux is equal to surface area times the gradient, the difference from, let's say, sun to shade in heat, times conductance. And conductance is influenced by the texture and appendages on the surface of the organism. If you alter any of those three components, flux can change. Organisms have adapted maintain constant internal conditions because homeostasis means relatively constant function of all the biological processes. So some organisms activity level is governed by the ambient temperature and in the old vernacular those are called cold-blooded. Others regulate their, inter their temperature Internally, these are called warm-blooded. More correctly, endotherms are those which have heat sources within the body, and ectotherms are those that, whose heat comes from external sources. We can also call these the two categories homeotherms, where temperature is self-determined, and poikilotherms, externally dictated temperature. Let's look at a typical poikilotherm or ectotherm like a frog. The sun sends heat to the frog and the wind blowing across the frog's surface carries some away. That's convection. If a butterfly passes by or sits on the frog momentarily, heat is exchanged. And heat is also exchanged with the ground, so this is conductive exchange. The frog can modify its shape by stretching out, increasing the reflective surface or huddling very small, and also its behavior. And many poikilotherms will seek shade in very hot conditions, and when it's cool out, you'll find them on the surface of a rock or asphalt warming up. But there are costs associated with temperature regulation, and I want you to think about some someone like this frog or maybe a lizard, an animal that has to bask to obtain heat, what are some of the costs that this creature might face? 
one of the costs would be energy to move to such a place, but the other might be even greater because by being exposed to the sun, you're also much more visible to predators. So regulation of temperature for any organism is a compromise between the benefits and the costs. Poikilotherms have their metabolism correlated with temperature. The higher the temperature, the faster their metabolism. And in a hot desert, you can see lots of these little poikilotherms skittering around. If it's too high, they may cook. If it's too low, they may freeze. So for poikilotherms, survival is seen across the widest range of temperatures. For organisms to grow, to consume food and put on weight and change developmental stage, that's in a narrower range of temperatures. And to reproduce, the requirements for temperature are more particular, narrower still. So this effect of temperature on development is most evident in poikilotherms. For example, the butterfly eggs we mentioned in the first lecture, the caterpillars feed through their different developmental stages and eventually pupate, become chrysalis. It takes about 20 days in the lowlands, where it's warmer, and 30 days in uplands, where it's cool. And this may be a simple metabolic difference. But there are ecological consequences for this difference as well. Taking longer to develop in the cool uplands means the caterpillars spend longer time exposed to their predators, parasites, and pathogens. But what's very interesting to me about poikilotherms and ectotherms, they don't have a set developmental time depending the conditions under which they develop, the length of time may be shorter if it's warmer or longer if it's cooler. Homeotherms or endotherms on the other hand do have a set developmental time. Nine plus months for humans, a couple years for elephants. In addition, for many organisms that are um, both poikilotherms and endotherms, temperature could be a stimulus for development. For example, for some plants, their seeds don't germinate unless they are frozen first. But speaking of freezing, low temperatures can mean death for organisms not adapted to withstand it because ice crystals can form within cells, cutting them and um, making them no longer able to function. So structures that overwinter are usually dormant developmental stages. Seeds of plants, eggs of organisms, or pupae, chrysalises. For many um, organisms, slowing down metabolism for too long can lead to them becoming moribund, which means near death. And when organisms are moribund, their cell, their bodies don't have normal um, cell production and repair. And for too long at a cold temperature, the organism becomes weak and dies or dies from other causes. Now homeotherms or endotherms regulate their temperature effectively, but we spend a large amount of energy doing so. For most homeotherms, the rate of heat produced is controlled by an internal thermostat, and body temperatures are usually between 35 and 40 degrees centigrade. Homeotherms lose heat to the environment, but this heat loss is moderated by a number of things both on their surface and beneath the surface fat, and also different uh, patterns of blood flow. When homeotherms are too hot, heat loss can be increased by more rapid breathing and also by moving to a cooler habitat. So look at these examples of organisms and tell me and yourself 
which is a poikilotherm, that is temperature dictated by the external environment, and which is a homeotherm. So the organisms that are warm-blooded are homeothermic. I'll circle them here. You can probably guess yourself. The fox, the manatee, and the chicken. These are ones that have internal thermostats that allow them to expend energy to regulate their temperature. The rest of these things, the plant, the invertebrates, and the fish are poikilotherms. So in general, mammals and birds are endotherms, and other animals are ectotherms, as well as plants, fungi, and protists. There are exceptions to these generalizations, though certain insects can heat themselves up, maybe in advance of uh, spewing out toxic chemicals, and some plants also can generate heat. One example of such a plant is the jack in the pulpit. This and many other members of the Araceae come up early in the spring while there's, the ground is still covered with snow and their inflorescences generate heat and melt the snow, attracting any early flying insects. One cool method animals use, endotherms, to conserve heat is countercurrent circulation where there are opposing fluxes of fluids that can transfer heat. For example, in the gills of fish, well, I guess this is transfer of oxygen, blood and water are opposed so that there's a large oxygen gradient and a rapid flux of oxygen into the blood across the entire structure of the gill. A similar arrangement is present in bird lungs, and with their high expenditures for flying, they need a high rate of oxygen delivery. So countercurrent fluxes can help organisms of really cold regions conserve heat. The non-feathered legs and feet of birds have warm arterial blood moving toward those feet, but the, and the cooler venous blood coming back to the body core, the heat transfer inside the body of the bird cons conserves the heat in the inside instead of putting it out to the environment through the feet. And the little kangaroo rats in the desert that rely on seeds for their moisture in their diet, they use a countercurrent process to keep moisture in their body rather than exhaling it to the dry desert air. And of course, some organisms like this tubby arctic seal are very well insulated. This organism is using fat in addition to maybe a furry coat to keep warmth in the body.